said, unless the ransom was paid within 10 days, we shall send you the other ear. John Paul Getty III was just 16 years old and lived in Italy when members of the Italian Mafia grabbed him off the street on July the 10th, 1973, as he returned home from a night out with friends. He was thrown in the back of a van and taken 300 miles south to the mountains of Calabria, with his captors soon informing the teenager's family that the boy will be safely returned after they are paid a $17 million ransom. The boy's mother, Gail Harris, and father, John Paul Getty Jr., had been cut off from the family's fortune, and they asked John Paul Getty if he'd be willing to cover the amount of money demanded by the kidnappers. At the time, John Paul Getty was worth little less than $2 billion, making not only the richest man in the world, but also the wealthiest man in history. That is when the already shocking incident took the most bizarre twist of all, with John Paul Getty refusing to pay the ransom money. John Paul Getty said at the time that if he agreed to the demand made by the kidnappers for the return of his grandson, then there was nothing to stop financially motivated individuals from abducting his other grandchildren. If I pay one penny now, I'll have to pay 14 kidnapped grandchildren, he told reporters at the time. He was known at the time as much for his oil fortune as for his frugality, and some believed at first that John Paul Getty III may have staged the entire kidnapping to get the money from his grandfather. John Paul Getty Jr. had been cut off after his drug addiction led to him leaving the family business and wife Gail, who was quickly cast aside by the Getty family. It was Gail, however, who pushed back on the former father-in-law and used the press to launch a subtle attack that eventually shamed the man into paying the ransom. That took four months, however, and after the kidnappers showed just how far, they were willing to take negotiations. The kidnappers kept Paul drunk on cheap cognac in the cave and rural huts. They gave him a radio and a pet bird. Each day he was unchained for an hour of walking and smoking. He tracked days by making small scratches on a rock. And after 50 days passed with no action, the kidnappers became increasingly agitated. Early one October morning, around three months into his ordeal, Paul received a haircut from his kidnappers. The next morning he was fed a meal of five steaks and pressed to eat as much as he could. Afterwards the team was blindfolded and a handkerchief was placed in his mouth. He bit hard as the man secured his arms, legs and head. Then they sliced his right ear with a single sweep of a razor sharp blade. Paul told the police, recalling how his wound became badly infected and the penicillin he was given poisoned him. I was vomiting. I didn't move for about 10 days. His ear was wrapped in a bag along the strands of his hair and a note that said, unless the ransom was paid within 10 days, we shall send you the other ear. It was sent to Messiero, newspaper in Rome, but a national postal strike meant the gruesome parcel took three weeks to reach its destination. Upon its arrival, Gail recognised the freckles on the ear. She knew it belonged to her son. This forced John Paul Getty into the negotiating table and he agreed to pay 2.2 million for the return of his grandson while loaning an additional 700,000 to his son, which he'd have to be paid back with interest. The money was quickly handed over to the kidnappers who had been keeping their captive in a tiny village. On December the 15th, John Paul Getty III was dropped off at a gas station just north of where he was being held in the mountains. Nine people were ultimately arrested for the kidnapping, but only two were convicted, and the ransom money was never located despite police efforts. There was also no great reunion between grandfather and grandson, with John Paul Getty refusing to take phone calls from the recently released captive when he called from Italy. Gail was followed by the press and did everything in her power to get her son back, despite having no access to any of the Getty funds and no support from her drug-addicted ex-husband. Get it from London, she was told by the kidnappers, when she explained her predicament, suggesting she had to call former in-laws. That was later followed by a letter from her son, which read, Dear Mama, since Monday I've fallen into the hands of kidnappers. Don't let me be killed. With no money and little time, 
Gal used the press to shame her former father-in-law and his refusal to hand over any of his fortune. It was also Gail that to convince the entire Getty family that this was not some prank by her son in a bid to get a multi-million dollar payday. Through this all, Gail was forced to communicate with J. Fletcher Chase, a former CIA operative. He was employed by John Paul Getty as he refused to speak to Gail directly. Fletcher Chase arrived in Italy to try and get the kidnapped team back without paying any ransom at John Paul Getty's insistence and was ultimately accused of almost botching the operation by making a number of foolish moves. Chase arrived in Rome five weeks after the kidnapping and soon began sleeping with a woman who was reportedly being paid to feed him false leads while suggesting the entire kidnap was a hoax. He also botched his first attempt to hand over the ransom to kidnappers. The aftermath of the ordeal left John Paul Getty III a reckless personality. A year after his release, he married a German photographer, Gisela Zacker. They lived for a time in New York, where they consorted with a crowd of Andy Warhol. Mr. Getty became a drug user and a heavy drinker. A 1981 drug overdose, a cocktail of Valium, methadone and alcohol, left him a quadriplegic and partially blind. John Paul Getty III died in 2011. John Paul Getty died in 1976. He left his son $500 in his will. And John Paul Getty III, his grandson, nothing. <laughs>